This is also a, a, a global issue, of course. This is a, also a global issue. Extreme weather events are happening all around the world. Can turn it down. Wet, dry weather, wet right flashes going on. There's melting of glaciers and ice caps that, that is releasing fresh water uh, to the oceans. And higher temperatures are increasing demand for water. Of course, in California, let's talk about California. We're in the me mega drought. Uh, we've had droughts in the past, but climate change, a study has shown that climate change is making these droughts more extreme by about 20% so far. That's the information. So we are in a mega a drought now in the state. We have less Sierra uh, and local snowpack. Snowpack has been our primary, our biggest reservoir of water in the past. The water is held in the wintertime as snow. It melts slowly in the past, and it, and it fills our reservoirs in the spring and summer. We don't have that anymore. This past year, January, February, and March were the driest uh, and the less snow we've ever had in California. So it's a serious issue. Now we're getting our primary precipitation by what's called atmospheric rivers, or some people used to call them pineapple expresses, where these infrequent, intensive storm events come through. They are mainly rain, and they dump uh, large amounts in, in, in a short period of time, and they, of course they, cause, they can cause flooding and uh, landslides and other things. So if you look at California now, this is a picture, the most recent picture of the drought in California. And you can see that the entire state is in a severe drought situation. And in the Central Valley, it's even worse. It's exceptional drought or extreme drought. So we do, we have, we are in a situation now and it doesn't look, uh, it doesn't look optimistic for the near term to, for us to get out of the situation. Now the state has uh, uh, just come out last month with what's called California's water supply strategy, adapting to a hotter, drier future. And I want to read the, uh, one of the opening part of this. It says, over the next 20 years, California lose 10% of its water supply. Our climate has changed, and the West continues to get hotter and drier. As it does, we will see, on the average, less snowfall more evaporation and greater consumption of water by vegetation, soil, and the atmosphere. So we're, we're losing water supply, and that is because of climate change. So what is the state doing? There's four points they make in here. They're, they have $8 billion they're dedicating to, to this. Uh, the first is to expand water storage, both above, above and below down. Uh, more recycled water facilities, funding those more ocean and groundwater desal. And the final one down here is permanently eliminating waterways using water more efficiently. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about, how to save more water. So here in Redlands, you can see from this chart on the right, we've had a significant dip in precipitation over the last 20 years. In fact, there's less water for Redlands water treatment plants, which I'll talk about in a minute. Less surface water for groundwater recharge, recharging the groundwater basin. And our, our groundwater basin is currently at historic lows. Now there are plans that are addressing this. The city has some plans that have a, a call for water contingency, water storage contingency plan. They've updated their water master plan. And of course, they've hired a conservation staff and have conservation programs here in the city. So I want to turn now, I want to, I want to mention though that Redlands is not running out of water. I want to be clear that that's, that's the case, not right now. But we need to conserve to maintain what we have. So I'm going to move into be more specific about what's happening in Redlands and what Redlands water supply. I'm an engineer, so I like data, and I'm going to give you some things about where our water comes from, how much we use, uh, how much you use individually, etc. So let's let's look at this. 
We're very fortunate to have a diversified portfolio of water. We have four water sources in Redlands. We have surface water from the Santa Ana River and Hell Creek. We have imported water that's available through the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, Northern California water. We have a large groundwater basin to pump from called the Bunker Hill Basin. This really is our primary source of reliability. And we have recycled water, which is what Andrew's going to be talking about. I want to point out that this picture here is, is one of the basins that my conservation district, I'm a board member. This is a, 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 a basin that is filled with water. And you can see in the background, you can see the Seven Oaks Dam on the mountains. This water is put in the basin and slowly percolates. I'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. So this is the groundwater basin. This is a photo of the groundwater basin. You can, I'll just uh, point out a, a couple things that orient you to the map. Oops, excuse me. Wrong one. Uh, here's the I-10 going across the 210, 215 freeway over here. Here we are in Redlands. This uh, basin is uh, throughout the entire valley here is our basin. Uh, and what is a groundwater basin? Well, it's like a big bathtub. It's full of water. Uh, hopefully it's full most of the time, but we pump out of that basin. The uh, city has wells and, and water districts throughout here have wells in that basin. They pull the water out, but the water needs to be put back in the basin too. And where does that happen? Well, that happens from these various streams that come out of the mountains. The largest one, however, is the Santa Ana River, which comes through here and Mill Creek. And in this little area here, I want to show you some, some an aerial view of some facilities that my water conservation district have to put water back in the ground. Here's Green Spot Road along here. Here's the Redlands uh, Airport, San Bernardino Avenue. So we're the confluence of these two and above this, we have a large amount of land and we have in that, that, in that land, we have, we dig big trenches or basins. We divert water as it comes out of the mountains into these basins, and we have to have a lot of storage area because the water comes fast sometimes. So we need a lot of land area because we need a lot of basin area. Uh, and the water goes into basins like you saw in that last picture, it stays in the basin and slowly percolates into the ground. And that's how we recharge our groundwater basin, by taking water that's we have locally that comes out of the mountains when it's wet, when the snow melts, and we put it back in the basin. Uh, we also have so the large, the largest. Sorry. Clickers. I can't go back now. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. So these we have basins also in the Mentone area here, and the largest basins we have here. We have plans to expand these basins so that we can recharge even more water. So those currently exist. Yes. That's. Been doing this for a hundred years. Uh, the, uh, the farmers in the past uh, formed this district, and now we're a public agency. So let's let's talk a little bit more about specifics about these water sources. How much water do we get from each one of these sources? Well, groundwater is our primary primary source. Fifty to sixty percent of the water comes from that. That's the big green area. When it's wetter. We, use, we can use less groundwater and more surface water. When it's drier, we use more groundwater than, than surface water, because surface water isn't available. We also have state project water, which is imported water from Northern California. That supplements the supply, particularly in the summertime for Redlands, for the, so they can keep their water treatment plants running. And we have recycled water, and that, that water use is gonna be, gonna be expanded. And again, Fernando will talk about that. So uh, those are the sources. So how much do we use? Well, we use 18.5 million gallons a day. What does that mean? Well, that's 925 foot swimming pools that are filled every day from Redlands. That's how much water they have to produce to do that. That's a lot of water. We have a very reliable water supply. In the winter, it's less. And in the summer, it's more because of irrigation demands. Uh, and uh, at peak hour, it has to be city needs to be able to provide about three times what they should do on the average. So 925 swimming pools each day on the average. So to do that, they have to have a really robust water distribution system, and they do. 
billions of dollars worth of investment in facilities. Facilities such as water treatment plants, groundwater wells, reservoirs, 55 million gallons of storage, that's three times the amount of use on the average day, 44 booster pump stations, and a lot of pipelines. So we're fortunate to have a very robust distribution system to get into that. So who uses the most water in that What do you, who do you think? Farmers. Residents. We're primarily single family dwelling units here. So 60% of the water in Redlands is used by single family dwelling units. Another 14 by multiple family dwelling units. But commercial, we don't have any real wet industries here, of course, so commercial and industrial is 12%, and large landscapes, 13%. Things like the school, school uh, playgrounds, the, the University of Redlands, the uh, golf course, et cetera, and those others. So most of our use is residential. And you ever think about how much water you use for individual functions in your, in your house? <coughs> Inside water use accounts to about 30% of the water we use. We use 70% of the water outside. So that really creates the biggest opportunity for us to save more water is outside in irrigation, in conversions of landscape, uh, in uh, drought tolerant plants, etc. And that's going to be our next seminar that we'll talk to you exactly how to do that. But you look at this the toilets, flushing, showers, faucets, washing machines, they're all essential things, of course, for heat. But they only, they only use about 30% uh, of the water, so 70% outside. This is a chart of uh, Redlands water use overall. On the left-hand side, you can see Redlands, uh, the, the bar is, is highest for Redlands on the left-hand side. This is what's called gallons per capita per day. You take the total amount of water that you produce, you divide it by your population, and, and you see how much water per capita. We can see here in Redlands, we use more than our neighbors, quite a bit more than Highland, San Bernardino, or the Kuiper. So there's opportunities here, I believe, for us to save more. And that's what we're talking about today. Now, this is probably should be familiar to most of you. It's our, it's our water bill. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just talk to you about how you, there's good information on the water bill. First, on the right-hand side is uh, the, the uh, charges for the water. And I'd like to point out that four, there's only two, these in the box here are the only charges for your water, the rest are for other things. So when you consider this your water bill, it really is your city utilities bill. It's not just for water, only 40% of really the bill is for water. Uh, this information here is the size of your meter. How much water you use is the difference in reading between previous and before. This is 18 units. These are funny units that are called HCFs, 100 cubic feet. Uh, that's how the water is sold here. Um, and that's equivalent to 740 gallons, so it's a lot of water. So how do they charge for water? Well, first there's a charge, a fixed service charge based on the size of your meter. Of your meter. Uh, most of the meters are one inch or three quarter inch, and that's a fixed charge. And that's for having all the facilities available to make sure you, when you turn on your water that you, you get what you, through that meter, the amount that that meter can, can uh, discharge into your system. So that's, that's for that, all of these facilities, million dollars worth of things that I talked about in operational those. The second part of it is an increasing block rate structure for how much you use. And that's the one down here. And that's the one where if you save, if you reduce your water use, you can save money. So uh, you can see here that the lowest rate is $1.46, and then it goes up in increasing blocks. So for example, this one is 18. So that's two, two units above. So you can save 16 units by 146. And you have two units in the next classification, two times 178 and you get this number here. The more you use, the more you pay. So that's what I wanted to bring forth on this one. The next one on the other side is historical water use. Here is the gallons that were, uh, that were used over the last 60 days. These bills, of course, are two-month bills. So this is historical information. This is how much you've used. This was the last, this is uh, June and May, May and June. This one is before that period where it's probably not as hot, so you don't use as much water outside, so you can see that's much less uh, March and April. 
And then there's a graph of water, of water uh, up here. How much you've used, the black is what you're using currently. The, uh, the other one shows you what you've used in the past. And then the city has some goals for water conservation. So there's good information on the water bill you can use and how much water you use. Uh, but it is historical, it's looking back. So uh, the city is considering putting in uh, new meters, smart, they call them smart meters, which have automatic readings. It's gonna take a replacement program over a number of years. I think all the development has these smart meters, but they're able to read out in hours or in days, et cetera. And finally, for me, water meter. You can do, you can read your own water meter if you'd like to. Uh, this is the box where the water meter is located at my house. Uh, it's kind of hidden <laughs> under some shrubs here. But uh, if you flip that uh, concrete cover, you see this. This is your water meter that's in there. It's kind of a yucky place. You've got to watch out for spiders if you, <laughs> if you uh, put your hand in there or something. But you, you can see this meter, and you can you can actually read it yourself. It's an odometer. It's pretty easy to read. And if you, if you have some trouble, the Jasmine will come out and tell you how, how to read it. So, uh, anyway, in any case, that's, that's what you can do. Uh, and uh, if one, of the, one of the things you might want to do is see if you have any leaks. So you can check if the reading at the, uh, when you go to bed at night and there's no water use, and then do it first thing in the morning, you can see if you got any leaks, any changes in that meter with any fading up. So you might have some leaks in your system. So that's it for me, and I'm going to turn it over now to Fernando. Who's going to talk about recycled water and water energy nexus? Fernando. Hello, everyone. So, City of Redland Recycle Water and Water Energy Nexus. So, what do I mean by that? Okay. Well, first off, show of hands, does, uh, how many people here know what recycled water is? Okay, good amount, all right, perfect. So um, this will be easy to follow along. Um, so uh, City of Redlands actually has led the industry on the West Coast uh, in incorporating NBR technology. NBR stands for membrane bioreactor, and I'll get to, to that later. So that's what produces recycled water. So in the early 1990s, uh, the city of Redlands decided to venture into avenues to conserve water, specifically groundwater, and try to get away from that. And I, uh, I'm, I'm actually really impressed that that discussion started in the 1990s because NBR technology was introduced to the states in the late 1980s, 1989 actually to be exact. So whoever led that charge, hats off to that person. That was probably Dick, but I think that you were part of uh, MUED at the time. So, um, so conserving the precious groundwater was the main driver to go before the California Energy Commission in 2000. Quickly after that, by 2003, the recycling facility or the wastewater treatment plant was producing recycled water. Very impressive. Three years time is unheard of. So it's um, what what. The reason why it was such a fast process was um, because of how the MBR facility can tie into any facility. So with City of Redlands, we're on a uh, hybrid approach. We have a conventional activated sludge process and we have a MBR uh, facility all within one plant. So um, what happens here is Okay, this is the raw water coming in. This is conventional. So let me back up. Conventional, I like to com compare conventional and NBR to a old classic car versus a sports car. <coughs> NBR being a sports car, conventional being a classic car. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. So it comes in raw water. Uh, actually, I, the slide you presented, 30% of what the household uses, flushes down the toilet, showers with, comes to us. And this is a 30% plus other sources. So we screen it, we go through primary clarifiers, we go through an aeration basin, we go through a secondary clarifier, and then finally we discharge to those percolation ponds that Dick was just this was explaining about the recharge the groundwater Boker Hill. So this is strictly all gravity. And 
and detention time, and from this point to this point, eight to 12 hours. So that's what makes it a slower process. We go to the MBR uh, process. So similar, comes in, screening, aeration basins. Aeration basins are, uh, it's a biological treatment where we use microorganisms to break down organic material. And then this is where it separates. At this point, we send it to an MBR facility. And that facility is used, uh, we use uh, power, energy, to separate the solids from the liquid. And this phase right here, this was eight to 12 hours. This is probably two to four hours for us to produce clean water. And that's where the supercar comes in. That's just the Ferrari 458. We can do what, this is uh, eight to 12 hours, we produce about one to 1.5 million gallons per day. We produce about four to 4.5 million gallons per day in that time frame, which is a two to four hour zone. So that's exactly why the, it's so easy to convert to the three year phase of how uh, fast it was to convert to tertiary Title 22 water happened because it, it, you can do it within the existing infrastructure. You just have to engineer a few bases. So where does our reclaimed water go? So our reclaimed water goes to uh, one of our big users is the Mountain View Power Company, Edison, the, the generating plant over on uh, San Bernardino, and they use that for cooling tower purposes. Uh, dust control at the city's landfill, that's required for state guidelines. Uh, we also use the water within the treatment plant for, um, for, uh, for pump seals and uh, sprayers. And uh, we also use it for agriculture, a few uh, orchards around town and landscaping, uh, some warehouses over by the Mountain uh, View, uh, San Bernardino warehouses over on that, and that's all on recycled water. So actually right here is perfect. All this is recycled water, and this orange is the non-potable water, groundwater, the uh, uh, wells. So, uh, well, let, let me, uh, has it, you've seen the purple pipes around the city and does anybody know where the purple comes from? Okay, so um, Irvine Ranch Water District, they're the pioneers in recycled water. So they were actually the first agency to get permitted in actually the nation to produce recycled water. And they, uh, they picked purple to <laughs> distinguish the pipes from potable and non-potable. So everyone has standardized purple pipes now. So it's a local agency. We link on the, uh, Irvine a lot for guidance. They have an MBR facility. As a matter of fact, they have the same exact facility we have. However, we incorporated that facility before Irvine. We were the first ones on the West Coast, city of Redmond. So as demand increases, storage will also need to be addressed. So we're currently engineering um, reservoirs to accommodate this increase in demand, supply and demand. So we anticipate um, we anticipate our uh, our end users to increase here relatively sh in a short period of time, especially because uh, water shortage is, is not a surprise. It, it, it's, it's a real it's reality. So we are actually getting a lot more requests for recycled water. So with that, we need to start constructing these reservoirs to be able to supply that water at different pressure zones. Um, more importantly, because we can do water in our immediate pressure zone, but once we start venturing into, say, the south side of Redmond, we need to increase those pressure zones via pumps, in turn, have reservoirs. So we're currently in design for uh, two 1.5 million gallon uh, reservoirs on site. Um, we just received one of the tech memos, so we're reviewing that as we speak. So the future of wastewater treatment is resource recovery. Um, one of the presenters here introduced us and he, he wanted to know what uh, water energy nexus is and this is exactly what it is. So, what is water energy nexus? So, since our facility, since our facility also uh, processes organic waste, solids, we, um, and liquid waste, we take full advantage of this opportunity and convert the byproduct the byproduct from the organic waste via digesters 
and we convert that to energy. So um, the city of Redlands has shifted their wastewater treatment plant mindset to resource recovery here within the last several years. Um, our team is focused on sustainability and energy management for future gear for uh, the future geared towards a water resource recovery center. So what does that, all that mean? So our recent upgrades at the NDR facility and the solids handling facility um, have provided the opportunity to take full advantage of the water energy nexus. So these upgrades have paved an avenue to reduce energy consumption. Uh, we work closely with the manufacturer, which is the Suez. Uh, they're a French company now bought out by VOA, which is also French. And we work closely with them to optimize communications controls with these new uh, scouring blowers um, within the MBR facility. We integrated these new blowers to modulate airflow based upon actual demands. So it's real time demand. So there's a parameter called TMP, transmembrane pressure within these modules. It's an ultra filter. So when solids accumulate on these filters, it's real time. It increases or decreases depending on the solids on these <coughs> filters because we work with the manufacturer. And that's another hats off to Redlands. We, we work closely with them and now they incorporated their, that same technology and that same control strategy moving forward. This just happened two years ago. So that's hats off to us. And that was the incentive. We, we were able to save about $155,000 per year in energy costs. We put 1.5, million kilowatts per hour back into the grid and we also got a three hundred thousand dollar incentive because of that so it's 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 really good for the city um so so also and then another another i guess venture we're moving towards is this energy optimization energy efficiency through what we call this is a get this is a natural gas conditioner at the facility so this conditions gas. So um, it's driven by air quality requirements. We no longer are producing dirty air, but we decided to take full advantage of that and put it back into the system. This is a digester back here. And this is a uh, boiler heat exchanger that heats up the digester in our facility. So because we condition that gas, it has a higher heating value. So we recirculate that biogas to this boiler heat exchanger, use it as a fuel source, and we no longer rely on natural gas. So we've got off the grid on natural gas now too. And that's it for me. Uh -huh. yeah.
you're watering in the early morning hours or in the late evening hours, that's the best time to water. And so when um, I have this little caption box and it says water restrictions affect all outdoor water use. So sometimes we'll have residents calling and say, well, what about if I need to wash my car? We would prefer that you do it during your watering days. So any water usage should happen on your watering days that are assigned to you. Um, and then if you ever have um, any issues with your timer, we can actually come out, which is that little controller, like the brain for your sprinkler system. We, you can schedule a visit, myself and then another water conservation uh, specialist, Myra, will come out and we'll go and adjust your timer Make sure that it's watering on the right days during the right times for the right amount of time um, and then we'll we can also come out to your to your residence and we can do a water audit so if you realize that you know your last spill um, and your new bill there's a hundred dollar difference and you're not sure why you haven't changed your usage you can schedule a visit we can come out and we can check your timer we can you know walk around your property make sure that there aren't any leaks uh, and we can help you also uh, figure out ways to save water around your home. Perhaps your toilet is leaking and you might not even know. So these are some of the rebates that City of Redwoods offers. I'm gonna try and use this little thing. So um, you can't see very well, but it's it's uh, for the smart irrigation controller. So again, that's kind of the brain of your, your sprinkler system. We offer up to a hundred and fifty dollar rebate for the irrigation controllers, and they're usually between sixty and two hundred dollars, depending on how fancy you want it. Um, so we rebate up to a hundred and fifty dollars uh, for an irrigation controller. So if you have an old one and it's time to upgrade, um, all you need to do is fill out an application. And I'm gonna go over it in a little bit, but um, it looks like this. And again, I printed some, and there's some in the back. Um, and we can also help you fill this out if you need help with that. And so um, we would also need a receipt for the uh, irrigation controller, just to prove that you purchased a new one and how much it costs. And then we rebate for high efficiency sprinklers. So if you have old sprinkler heads that are leaking or broken, uh, broken sprinklers release a lot of water. You'll see them kind of shooting up like a water spout. Um, so we rebate those at $4 per sprinkler head. And then they're usually about $8, so we rebate about half of the cost. Um, and then we rebate for high efficiency washing machines. Right now, our rebate is $100 per washing machine. I know that's not a ton because they're quite pricey, but it's something and it's a credit on your water bill. Um, and then we rebate for toilets. So if you need a new toilet, um, they pretty much only make water efficient toilets nowadays. And we rebate $100 for the toilets. And we rebate per toilet. So if you need to change four toilets in your house, you get $400. A, a credit on your water bill. And then the two most important things um, to save water outdoors, which is what we really want to focus on today, like Richard mentioned, is um, landscape conversion. So taking out some of that water thirsty turf. So if you do the drop floor landscape conversion, which is this one, so if you decide to plant some beautiful lantana or some other California native plants and you put some mulch and some drip irrigation, um, that we rebate at 61 cents per square foot. So let's say you have, um, we'll go out and we'll do a pre-inspection. So we'll come measure the area of your yard that you're going to remove the turf from, and then we'll multiply the square footage by 61 cents and we'll get a total. It does have a cap of $500. So right now that's the cap. Um, and I'll share a little bit more. Um, but um, so it's 61 cents per square foot for the drought tolerant landscape conversion, and it has that cap of $500. And then there's the synthetic turf or irrigation list, so zero irrigation ground cover. Some people really like to have the fake turf, the astroturf. They don't want to have any maintenance or any water, or they just want to put rock outside. That's, you know, to each their own. So that, um, uh, uh, conversion has that rebated um, at a dollar per square foot, and that one has a cap of three hundred dollars. So it's a little bit less than the other um, conversion rebate um, cap. But the, the
Dolly, you curse for her to just tire, but the cast is lower for some reason. This is before my head. <laughs> um, but we are actually going to increase our, our rebates as of October 4th. So we just recently put a request to city council. They're going to be um, reviewing it and putting a motion through on October 4th. But I've been told by my supervisor that I can share this, um, that most likely they will put it and pass it. And so as of October 4th, the drought tolerant landscape conversion and the synthetic turf uh, uh, rebate will both be at a dollar per square foot and they'll both have a cap of, um, I want to speak correctly, I want to say it's a thousand dollars. So it's going to increase for the cap. And some of you who have larger yards, you know, it, it caps out pretty quickly by the square footage. So <coughs> it's going to have a higher cap and a higher dollar value for the drop tolerance. And then we're also going to be increasing the rebate for the washing machine. It's going to go from $100 to $200. So um, we are going to have to uh, change our budget a little bit, but we're going to be able to allow that so that we have um, more, more money set aside per individual so that you guys can get a higher um, bang for your buck. So I'm just going to quickly go over the application that's on the screen. Um, again, it's, it, I mean, it looks kind of intense, uh, but really you just fill out this top portion, which is like your address, your name, you know, general information, and then you fill out the section by item you are getting um, rebated. So the first one is a high efficiency toilet. If you did that, great, fill that out. If you didn't, you don't fill it out. Um, and the next one is the synthetic turf or irrigation list conversion. So you would fill out that section if that's what you're doing. And the third section is the washing machine. I know you can't read it, but there's more back there. I just skipped over quickly. Um, and then we've got the weather-based irrigation controller, which has a rebate of $150. And then the high-efficiency sprinklers and the drought corner plant conversion. So again, you just fill out the section that applies to what you're going to be And we'd be happy to um, go over the application process with you in person if you need anything. Just stop by um, the municipal utilities building. If you ever figure to bill in person, um, you can just go up to the customer service and say, hey, I need to talk to our foundation specialist and they'll call, they'll call me up. All right, so how can you save water indoors? So Richard mentioned that it's about 30% of our water use is indoors. So ways that you can save. Um, and so, you know, if you have young children or things like that, if, there, if someone's taking a bath, uh, just fill in the bathtub pathway. That's super easy. Install aerators. If you don't know what an aerator is, it's just a small attachment that you put on your faucet, and instead of um, splashing out, it kind of, um, it has a small screen, so it comes a little bit more bubbled or air or aerated has more air in there. And so that can save quite a bit of water and aerators are very cheap. Um, so you can, you can purchase that, you can save some water while you're washing your hands. And we, when we say we wanna save water, nobody's telling you please stop washing hands or bathing. Of course, please do all of those things for your health. Um, but there are ways that we can kind of cut and be more efficient, right? And so some people like to put uh, um, like Home Depot buckets in their showers, they'll tell us, you know, we'll go out for a visit and they're like, you know, we save water, we do all this stuff, and it amazes me. I don't put, you know, I don't do that, <laughs> but some people um, like to save water that way, saving water from the shower, using it outdoors. Of course, um, turning off the water while you're brushing your teeth really self gives this. If, you, if the toothbrush is in your mouth, the, the faucet can be turned off, it shouldn't be running. Um, and then fixing leaks. Uh, and this might take a plumber unless you're handy, uh, but really leaks can waste a lot of water, more than you can realize, um, gallons of water a day. So going around, checking, listening uh, to see if, if there's any water running. And then Richard mentioned, um, if there's a time when you're outside the house, nobody's inside the house, or nobody's using the water in the house, and go check the meter and it's still running and spinning, um, then you know there's there's a leak and a board running around and checking. And you'll hear toilets 
to your hair curling button. So that's something that you can check and change your plunger or something simple inside of the tank. And then you can install high efficiency toilets. And again, we have rebates for that. And we tell kids this year we're taking five minute showers. Uh, what I like to do is play a couple songs on my phone and if, you know, pass those couple songs, I try to, you know, hurry it up and get out of there so I'm not wasting too much time in water. And then washing full loads of laundry. And it seems like, of course, yes. So just making sure your, your washing machine is full um, and you're not just washing a couple things and, and you know, using too much water. Okay, so ways to save water outdoors. Using water-wise lamps. Um, and so uh, Anka will be uh, hosting a workshop in October, and there's going to be more information on water-wise plants and transitioning your yard. Um, but water-wise plants are usually from areas that have similar climates as we do, or they're actual California native plants. So they're used to being in our climate, they're used to droughts, they're used to um, long periods of time without water. And a lot of them are quite beautiful. Um, some people think, you know, oh, it's just going to be a bunch of cactus and it's going to look like a desert. Um, and really, there's a lot of beautiful wildflowers and shrubs and all different colors and textures. So um, take, it, take, you know, take another look at, at water-wise plants. Um, Reimagine your yard. Uh, instead of having, you know, giant swaths of, of, you know, grass, you know, perhaps we can change uh, and reimagine maybe put some walkways through our spaces or things like that. Um, there's, uh, up, I'm going to go over a little bit of something called a rain garden. So you can put some like, um, something that looks like a stream, like a dry um, stream bed through your yard. There's so many different creative ways to design your yard in a water efficient way. Using drought resistant trees and plants, it seems kind of similar, um, but there are different plants trees, shrubs, ground cover. There's all different kinds of um, plant materials that you can use to design your outside landscape. Adjusting sprinkler heads and fixing leaves. This is one of the easiest things that you can do. Um, so go outside if you want to turn on all your sprinklers just for a little bit and just see, observe. Where are your sprinklers spraying water? Are they spraying water off the sidewalk? Well, sidewalk doesn't need water, of course. Are they spraying, um, are they spraying, is there an area of your yard that it isn't spraying, so perhaps, or are there any broken sprinklers? And again, we rebate those sprinklers at $4 per head. And then install drip irrigation and add a smart controller. So drip irrigation is a very efficient way to water um, plants. And so you might have seen it kind of like tubing, like brown tubing um, in certain gardens. And so um, these uh, are, drip irrigation is designed to bring water directly to the plants and not just spray overhead. So it's just bringing water <coughs> and literally dripping it more into the soil around the plant. And it, it's combined with the smart controller. So again, we'll recreate that at $150. And the smart controllers will, they should be weather-based. So on, like we, you know, for the past couple of weeks we've had rain on and off. So when it's raining, it shouldn't be watering. The the controller should have that sensor that it's not going to turn on while it's raining. Um, and then use a broom to uh, clean outdoors. You know, when I was young, um, I look I look younger than I am. <laughs> um, I'm 34, so I'm not I'm not that young. Um, and so I. I He would go and clean the driveway with the hose, right? He would, that was what he did every single time he mowed the lawn. And we loved it because of the smell. It smelled like it had rained or something on the concrete, me and my sister. But it's not really water efficient to just be, you know, spraying uh, concrete or pavement. So a better thing to do is using the broom, uh, you know, using a push broom to clean everything or uh, electric blowers to blow um, everything back onto the grass instead of your driveway. And um, setting lower blades to three inches. So um, cutting the blade, leaving 
the uh, grass a little bit taller actually is supposed to be more water efficient. And I just wanted to briefly share, it's not a rebate through City of Redlands, but um, the Air Quality Management District uh, has rebates for uh, electric blowers and electric mowers. So if you have an old mower that's gas uh, powered or you have an, um, an old blower that you need to replace, they do ask to have the machinery brought in and then, and then you'll um, purchase the new item that's an electric blower or electric mower and then you'll be rebates. I think it's like up to $250. It's a pretty good amount. Um, so if you want that contact, I have cards on the back table as well, so feel free to bug me anytime <laughs> and ask. Uh, and then using mulch. Using mulch is one of the biggest suggestions that I hear regularly for different webinars and booths. Uh, mulch is basically like ground up, uh, you know, tree material essentially. And so mulch is like is like having our skin. It protects the soil and it keeps moisture in the soil and it also um, so because it's holding moisture in the soil you don't need to water things as often it keeps the soil um, covered protected um, it also helps for that weed growing up a little bit better so mulch is really great I think it's a beautiful feature to add to um, there's different colors if you're interested in having different colored mulch there's different textures um, so I, I definitely recommend using mulch um, as much as possible, and it's quite, it's quite, it's quite affordable if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot to purchase. Okay, so um, when Richard invited, invited me, we kind of went over some different topics, and there were a few people in Anka that had some questions about rain barrels, and so we don't get a lot of rain um uh, so you, you're not gonna get it filled regularly but rain barrels can be useful the most the most uh they can be most useful in small garden spaces um i want to say they say about 20 feet out from the uh, barrel is as far as it can water or reach because it's just it's just being um it's just going down by gravity just going down on its own it doesn't have a pump so you can't have it go for far reaches um, so if you have your barrel it's usually about 50 to 80 gallons on average um, you'd like you want to have it by your downspout connected to your downspout so that when it does rain it feeds it right into the barrel and you do need a screen um, so that none of no mosquitoes go in there and lay eggs you definitely don't want to have um, that issue would start a new uh, West Nile virus or something. So that's required by California law. And the water should not be drank. It should not be consumed. It should only be used for outdoor um, lawn care. And so um, I can share my presentation. Um, Richard, you have it already. But if you if you were to click on this image, it um, I link the video of how to set up and do. A DIY setup of your own rain barrel. So um, it, I thought the video was really useful, so I linked it. Okay, so I just want to recap quickly since we're back here. Um, so again, the rain barrels are great if you're in a rainy area. In our area, it's nice, um, but it's mostly for for smaller garden spaces. Okay. All right, so I mentioned earlier for a rain garden. Um, if you had, let's say this whole area was covered in turf all the way to the fence, um, and they removed some of that turf, which you could apply for your turf removal rebate, and you um, decided you wanted to do some rain capturing without rain barrels or and having to worry about screens and mosquitoes and all the things, um, you can design what's called a rain garden. So um, there's mulch all around here as an example. There's some drought tolerant plants around. But really the main feature of this is kind of like a dry stream bed. Um, so when it does rain, ideally you would want to have like a, 
your your downspout um, somewhere or maybe on this side it's eating it. So that when it rains, it'll it'll trickle down on the rocks and it'll percolate or infiltrate or go down into the soil. So when it's beautiful and rainy, it'll look like a little creek. And when it's not, it just looks like a dry creek or like a nice sandy feature. Um, and so you'll actually be able to be helping the city of Redland by putting water back into our groundwater system. And of course, you can get a rebate for the turf removal that we do. So um, the best thing uh, is to use native vegetation. I mean California native vegetation, like on the outside. Um, and then it, it creates an attractive yard feature. And then it, it had it removes runoff from going into um, the storm water system. And it's kind of like cleaning and processing water. You know, the, the rainwater has hit your roof. The roof isn't super clean. <laughs> and then it goes down this downspout. And but as it goes through this little dry creek bed and, and, and infiltrates in, it's being cleaned by the rocks, or not cleaned, but filtered essentially by the rocks and the dirt as it goes down. So it's clean from that water. And it reduces um, flooding and erosion if you're having issues with that on your property. And again, this, um, I can share this presentation. The image has a, a link, and then this um, little highlighted word has a link that has a little description of it. Okay, so how does a rain garden work? So again, I mentioned it does need to be um, somewhat connected to your uh, downspout. So you want your downspout or your rain gutter to be moving water toward the rain garden. Um, and so you have to have dig a little bit deep, dig um, a little kind of like depression into the soil, fill it with some, um, some mulch, some um, you can fill it with, uh, they have California native soil, they have common cactus soil, something that has good drainage um, to fill into that into that um, depression in there. To that, sorry, these questions are so specific. There you go. Um, and so you'll fill it and then you can plant the California native on top. And again, this water will go down and seep in to the, um, into this little um, drain. And then native plants are anything that's native to California. But the other great thing about California native plants, other than the fact that they're used to our climate and they're used to drought, is that they are used to uh, the relationships with pollinators, butterflies, hummingbirds, things that are quite beautiful to look at. And so if you put some of those California native plants that are like the wildflower type, you'll be getting some more visitors in your, in your yard. And again, you can apply for the drought tolerant rebate if you do this on the project. Oh, okay. Um, so, I don't know about my timing. <laughs> but um, I have resources. Um, there's saveourwater.com, that's through the state water, um, the <coughs> California Department of Water Resources. Um, there's this, um, there's a Bay Area uh, water agency that has hundreds of landscape webinars. And in my downtime at work, that's usually what I do is I just learn about that. They have so many great resources. Um, and then if you need helpful plant information, the Pasadena Water and Power um, website, you can create uh, lists uh, picking plants. And they have really good examples for if you want shrubs, if you want trees, if you want um, grasses. And so that's a really great website for that. And then if you need any help uh, for gardening, um, the master gardeners are amazing. Um, I've gotten the privilege to work with them very often throughout my, you know, since 2016. And I, I, I really have made friendships with them. You can um, go to their website, you can call, you can ask the master, master gardener a question, you can send them a picture of your leaf and say, hey, you know, my leaf is yellow, all my leaves are yellow, what's going on, I don't know, I need help. And they'll actually answer all your questions. Um, they're really knowledgeable, 
they're volunteers, so there's no cost. So if you if you have got a blue ticket. 